So page 61, um, Exodus chapter 20, verse uh, 16. And the, the title of today's sermon is uh, Be Faithful, Not False. So that's the exhortation, that's the encouragement this morning as we look at God's word. Be faithful, be a faithful witness, don't be a false witness. Be faithful to truth and don't be telling lies by being a false witness. Now, we know we shouldn't tell lies. We do know that, don't we? Um, the Bible is quite clear. In Numbers 23, it says, God doesn't lie. <laughs> In the New Testament, it says, it's impossible for God to lie. And Proverbs tells us that God hates lying lips. So this ninth commandment certainly includes the command not to lie. However, its emphasis is on not being a corrupt witness, both in court and in life. And this is our focus this morning. We're, we have to focus in on something. We're going to focus in on this idea of being a witness. So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, we read, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And Part of that language is legal language. It is designed to make us think of a, a law court in a way. So that's the, that's the scene that this ninth commandment is designed to stir up in us. Not a law court like we think of today, but uh, uh, maybe a village, maybe a town where a, a gathering is called and where a judge is identified or a jury is identified within the town. Maybe it's in the open. Maybe it's in the front of a tent. Maybe it's at the city gate. And the judge is there, and the jury is there, and uh, the, the accuser or the witnesses are there. There's a defendant, and a verdict will be reached. That's the picture. And in this situation, God commands his people. He says, you shall not be a witness to falsehood against your neighbor, against anyone that should be placed before you in that situation. You shall not lie. You shall not call lies truth. You shall not bear false witness. Now why? Why shouldn't God's people bear false witness? Well, the first answer is that you shall not bear false witness because it denies God's character. God is righteous. He's good. He's upright. He's, his character is always in line with what is right. His character sets the standards for what is true and right. We read this about his character in Deuteronomy. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright, and just is he. And you might remember that Abraham, that father of Israel, the one that God called out of darkness in the, in the city of Ur to walk with him, he understood, didn't he, that he served and followed a righteous judge. He, he stood looking over the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, talking with God, and he said to God, will not the judge of the whole earth do right? Speaking to God, he knew that God was a righteous judge. Justice in Israel was to reflect God's character. Israel were his people and their courts were to reflect his righteousness. God was looking for a land that was filled and dotted with righteous courts, beacons of blazing light, testimonies to God's righteousness. His people were to reflect and uphold his character in their court. And so Deuteronomy 16 puts it a bit like this. God is speaking through Moses. Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town, the Lord your God is giving you. And they shall judge the people fairly. 
Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Follow justice and justice alone, so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. Do you see what God is looking for there in the land of Israel? This shining uh, display and reflection of his righteousness as the judge. And of course, he's looking for that in his church today from you and me. And we will take that in in a bit more detail shortly. So you shall not bear false witness because it denies God's righteous character, but it also distorts God's justice. A false witness in the court system was a serious thing. It had the power to make the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent. It had the power to free the guilty and put the innocent to death. How serious is that? In other words, false witnesses distort God's justice. They can make the system fall apart. Even though the system might be functioning and working in every other area, false witnesses breathe a poison and influence into the system which buckles and breaks it. Now, I think I watched a program once um, about metals. And a metal can be very strong. Uh, But if you add another metal to it or some other component and turn it into an alloy, it can become weak just by the influence of that other metal. It can, where it would have been strong and held up a bridge, it now buckles and breaks. Where a building could have been held up and and, and supported by by these iron girders or metal girders, now it crumbles and falls apart, all because of the influence of that one item. Well, in the same way, bearing false witness causes justice to collapse and it distorts God's justice. It's a real poison in the system. That's another reason why we should not bear false witness. What's a third reason why we shouldn't? Well, it results in the murder of the innocent. Of course, that isn't the case today, but in the time of Israel, that was often the case. Many of the crimes or, or, or wrongdoings that the people of Israel did when they came to the court, many of them were so serious that they resulted, they had as the verdict, execution, death, by stoning. And if you were found guilty, you were put to death. So to be a false witness was very serious. Can you see that? Your lies would often lead to an innocent person's death. And this was why in the law, the, the, the witness, the key witness, or the key witnesses had to throw the first stone of execution. They had to begin it. It was their responsibility. They had to take responsibility for the blood of the one they were putting to death. This is how it's put in Deuteronomy 17. The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting the person to death and then the hands of all the people. You must purge the evil from among you. So you can see it is important to God that evil, wickedness is purged, is cleansed from the land. That is right. And the court is to do it. And if you bear witness against someone who is wicked like that, then you are justified and right. But if you bear witness and it is false witness and you are about to put an innocent person to death, then the Lord demanded you look them in the eyes. And they looked you in the eyes before you threw that stone. Before their blood was on your hands. Now, in the passage we read in John chapter 8, 
about the woman that was dragged before Jesus by the religious leaders. There's many things going on when Jesus challenges them there. Yes, he's shining a spotlight into their hearts when he says, let him who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. But of course, in using that phrase to throw a stone, he is also turning the spotlight back to the law, even back to this commandment, even to the requirements of God. And Jesus knows that on some level, these men are false witnesses. They are not producing the whole truth. It is a trap that they have devised to trick Jesus and to entrap him. And Jesus brings the weight of the law upon their hearts and challenges them. It's like he's asking, who are the witnesses here? Who will take responsibility for her blood? Who will look her in the eye and claim that they have done justice here? Who will look God's righteous law in the eye and then throw the first stone? And we know. They all walk away. You see, in God's eyes, it's a very serious thing to bear false witness. To say a lie is true. Or to purposely speak things that are not true. So how was Israel to maintain justice? How were they to do that? in the land of Israel. Well, we're just going to look at one way that they were to maintain justice. And we're going to call it by the witness door. And this witness door simply is the requirement by the law that testimony had to be by two or more witnesses. If you were a solo witness, you could not enter through the witness door. You had to enter with at least one other person who was verifying and confirming your witness. And that was a form of protection. So here is where it is said in Deuteronomy 17, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person will be put to death. But no one is to be put to death on the testimony of one witness. This is repeated many times in the law. Here it is again. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offence they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So this was one of the great safety measures God gave Israel to ensure truth was spoken and justice was upheld. No one in the land from the king to the lowest person could simply say, I am so trustworthy, I can enter the door on my own. No one was to be so presumptuous and proud as to think their testimony on its own could be faultless. So, so far we have heard, you shall not bear false witness it denies God's righteous character, it distorts God's justice, and it results in the murder of the innocent, either literally, as in the days of Israel, or of a person's reputation and name and personhood today. So how does this teaching relate to you and me this morning? We're just going to think about three ways that this teaching relates to us. And the first one is bearing false witness in society. So let's just think about our interaction as Christians. If you're a Christian this morning, think about your interaction with society. You see, it's sadly true that false witness does happen in society by Christians, by you and me, and it's serious when it happens. Well, what does it look like? Well, we're just going to focus on one area this morning, and I don't mean to be overly predictable, but we're going to focus on social media. Uh, it's, it's, it, it remains a, a huge area of 
our life. So in social media, do, do you tweet as if what you're saying is truth when it could be a lie? Do you retweet lies that you haven't verified? Do you post on Facebook lies as if they are true? Or do you like a comment that is totally unverified and could be true or false? And you're quite casual. Has anyone here backed or supported or defended something publicly on social media only to find out later that it was untrue or wrong? Has that been an experience of yours? Or have you posted a comment against something claiming it was wrong or untrue only to find it was? This is not a good witness. What will society think of your claim that Jesus is the only Savior and God if they see you bearing false witness in other areas? And how does that happen? How, how is it that we can fall into this trap so easily on social media? Well, I think one answer is what we've been looking at. We don't maintain a door of witness. Like we saw here in the Bible. We don't insist that what we bear witness to be confirmed by more than one reliable source. We're so quick. Rather than waiting to see, rather than confirming what we are about to declare as truth for all the world to read. So do you remember the requirement of the witness door? Testimony is only to be considered valid when it is supported by two or more witnesses. This is the requirement that upholds truth in the court law. And it is able to uphold truth also in our social media activity. If you determine not to tweet or retweet or post or like anything that you have not been able to confirm by two or more reliable sources, you will place a witness door at the entrance of your social media activity, and it will keep you, at times, from bearing false witness, which should be high on your agenda of things to do. Why? Because it's a serious thing to bear false witness. How else does this teaching relate to us? Well, let's think about uh, bearing false witness in the church. Because that can happen too. And sadly, it does happen, dear brothers and sisters. False, bearing false witness does happen in the church amongst us. And it's serious. It shouldn't. Let's just focus on two aspects of bearing false witness. Gossip and slander. They are mentioned in the Bible as things that shouldn't occur, and they're mentioned because we easily fall into them. And what do these often look like, gossip and slander? Well, they often look like two or three people talking about another person who is not present and saying something about them that isn't true, or it's presented as true when it's really a lie. So in the book of James, he says this, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor. Do you see that gossip and slander dethrones God from the position of righteous judge? You become the lawgiver on some level when you gossip and slander. You become the judge of others. It's almost like you have set up a portable court and you are the judge. It could be set up in your kitchen 
as you talk to someone. It could be set up in your work office where you choose to talk about someone who isn't there. And you give your verdict. You give your evidence. You see, in your portable court, you're not only the judge, but you call only one witness. And it's you. You're the witness. That shouldn't happen. And you bear false witness against another person, not just a neighbor, but a brother or sister. Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 says, this shouldn't be. He says, truth, do not speak falsehood, get rid of it, but speak truthfully to each other. To your neighbor, speak truth. Why? Because you are brothers and sisters. You are of one family. So in erecting this portable temporary cord, you have ignored the requirement of the witness door. You've entered the door on your own. And you are bearing false witness. You are sentencing an innocent person. Without looking them in the eye, it's as if you're picking up the stone and casting it at them. And in some way, you're murdering their name and reputation. It's serious. It's not to be done. We are not to gossip and slander. Not lightly, not purposely. We're not to do it. God hates it. He hates lying lips. And when we do it, we have blood on our hands. And God will not hold the guilty guiltless. Gossip and slander have the potential to fill the church with portable courts of injustice and sin. We are to guard our testimony with the witness door, and we are not to enter it on our own. We are to speak of others to build them up. We are speak to speak of others with love at the right time to the right person. Because to bear false witness is serious. So if we are not to be false witnesses, what are we to be? And the answer is we are to be faithful witnesses. Faithful witnesses. The Bible talks often about faithful witnesses. Like Antipas in Revelation chapter 2, who was faithful unto death giving testimony to Jesus Christ. That's what we're to be, faithful witnesses to the truth. So just as God looked for faithful witnesses in the courts in Israel, he looks for faithful witnesses in his church today. And of course, Jesus was the ultimate faithful witness, wasn't he? That's how he's described in Revelation also. Remember, he was accused of being a solitary witness. That's what we saw in the passage we read, of walking through the witness door on his own, of his testimony not being valid. But Jesus could say, I have never spoken on my own. I have never spoken as a solitary witness. Everything I have ever said is true, and it is confirmed by reliable witnesses. He could point to John the Baptist and call him a faithful witness and say, he is your prophet, and he spoke of me. But he could point to his works themselves, and he could say, they are of greater weight and importance than John the Baptist, and they speak of who I am, my life, my miracles, my death, my resurrection, my ascension. They all declare who I am. But even above that, the Father himself, God, declares who I am. And I speak his words. He could say from heaven, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Do 
Jesus could say, I am not alone. I speak only what the Father tells me. He sent me and is always with me. When I speak, he speaks. I and the Father are one. You see, in Jesus the Son and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, we encounter one God and three eternal witnesses to truth. And Jesus is the reliable, verified, faithful witness to all truth. And that means that you this morning can build your life upon the words of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Whatever he says, you can build your life upon it. If you are experiencing the loss of a loved one, Jesus' words are reliable, they're true, they're verified. If you are feeling vulnerable because you are elderly, because you feel physically weak, and we are now in a pandemic, supposedly, you can trust in the words of Jesus. They will prove reliable. You can believe them. If you are in an identity crisis and you don't know who you are, you can believe the words of Jesus Christ. They are verified for all eternity. Jesus is the faithful witness and all his promises are true. His word can be trusted today. You can make decisions on his promises today and they will prove to be reliable. His words are validated for all eternity. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, if you've never encountered him, he can save you from your sin and from God's judgment of your sin. He is the faithful witness who can be there at the final judgment, the court of eternal judgment that all of us will stand in. We will all stand in an eternal court of judgment. We will face the piercing eye of the righteous judge. And on that day, it is possible through faith in Jesus now to have him speak on your behalf and for his words to stand for all eternity, that you are free of sin and judgment because you have put your faith in the one Savior that God gave this world. Jesus Christ, who laid down his life on a cross to be a substitute, that God might punish him instead of you, if you, by faith, will admit your need of a saviour. If you will see like those men who had stones in their hands, that they were guilty, they walked away, they should have fallen at Jesus' feet and said, speak for me. And so finally, Jesus calls us to be faithful witnesses to the one who is faithful calls me and you to be faithful. How are we to be faithful witnesses in this world? Well, there's one simple way. And we have it explained in John chapter 5. Here Jesus is talking to the Jewish leaders and he says to them, you study the scriptures, you study the Bible diligently with real detailed effort. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, says Jesus. The Bible faithfully testifies about me. It is a faithful witness. And when you or I come in line with the Bible, when we know the Bible, when we love the truth of the Bible, and we're willing to speak the truth of the Bible in this world, we will be faithful witnesses to Jesus Christ. Listen to what the law said to potential witnesses to truth. There we go. 
says, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a, law, in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. In other words, to be a faithful witness, don't fear the majority. Don't change your testimony to line up with the majority if they are false witnesses. Hold firmly to the truth of the Bible and so be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. You know how tragic it is when God's people have more enthusiasm for bearing false witness, for gossip and slander than for bearing faithful witness to Jesus. May God fill our eyes and hearts with his glory. May we love his truth and speak it to ourselves that our lives may be built on his words. May we speak it to each other that we might build each other up in his truth. May we speak it to the world that they might hear his gospel, see his glory and believe and be saved. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we are not called to bear false witness, but to be faithful witnesses to the truth. Amen.